believe it's time for kids' church. You guys can head on out, have fun, be good. Well, welcome everybody. It's good to see so many here. Some newbies, variety of people, and we welcome you here. Hope you feel at home with us. I'm Pastor Phil, and I'll be bringing you the, the word from the scripture today. Um, just want to say we're glad to have you here. Are you glad to be here? Okay, good, good, good. All right. Um, we've been talking about the Holy Spirit for a few weeks here. And let me just review. We've talked about the promise and the presence of the Holy Spirit. And let's just review a little bit. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity who works in you to live a godly life. Uh, he's a gift from God. He works in us to develop godly fruit like patience and self-control. Those things don't just come by trying harder, but they come by allowing the Holy Spirit to have more influence in our life. It's his fruit uh, working in us. And then last week, we started talking about the power of the Holy Spirit. And we, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 again today. That's where we started last week. And here in verse 1, it says that God does not want us to be ignorant or uninformed about spiritual gifts. And yet so often this is one area where Christians don't know much about spiritual gifts. But God does not want us to be uninformed. And so we understand that the Holy Spirit grants gifts uh, that are to benefit others. And I think there are three main divisions of spiritual gifts. There's gifts of comprehension, gifts of capability, and gifts of communication. And last week, we really focused in on the gifts of comprehension. Um, and we talked about the word of wisdom that's mentioned there in 1 Corinthians 12, which is supernatural guidance for difficult situations. And then there's the word of knowledge, which is supernaturally knowing the unknowable. And then we talked about discerning of spirits, a supernatural ability to see into the spirit world. These are gifts of the Holy Spirit, and we need them. We do. We need wisdom. We need knowledge. We need discernment. And we need more than what our natural abilities can supply. We need supernatural wisdom, supernatural knowledge, and supernatural discernment. And those come from the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit. And so today, we're talking again about the power of the Holy Spirit uh, and gifts of capability. And... Um, let me, let me, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and I'll, I'll read those pertinent verses again here. Um, sorry, I didn't have my Bible all ready to roll on this, but I can get there shortly. First Corinthians chapter 12, starting at verse 7, it says, Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom, to another, the message of knowledge by means of the same spirit. To another, faith by the same spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And to still another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same spirit. And he gives them to each one just as he determines. All right. And so let's talk some more about gifts of capability, gifts of power. And the first one is faith. Faith, the gift of faith. This is a supernatural ability to absolutely trust in God, uh, and it's imparted by the Holy Spirit for a specific need. This is a divine certainty that triumphs over everything. It's being absolutely certain. Now, Let's back up just a little bit. The entire Christian faith is based on faith. I mean, we just call it the Christian faith, based on faith, okay? Uh, in fact, faith is really a part of even natural life. Uh, you don't even have to be a Christian to have some form of faith, uh, because there is natural faith. This is the faith we have in other people. It's the faith the farmer has when he sows a seed, that there's going to be a crop, it's the faith that you have to sit down on that chair. That's natural faith. It's going to hold me when I sit down. There's, and we all have an element of that kind of faith. 
But then there's also saving faith that the Bible talks about. And that's mentioned in uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. It is by grace you have been saved through faith. And that's the kind of faith that really gets focused in on Jesus and trusts him for your salvation to get you into heaven. That's saving faith. And then we've also talked about faith as being part of the fruit of the Spirit. In Galatians 5.22, faith is a, as a fruit, it's part of Christian character. Um, it's a result of abiding in Christ. Uh, in fact, usually it's translated faithfulness. You know, in the fruit of the Spirit, there's, it's faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. But it's actually the same word in the original language simply as faith. It's a fruit of the Spirit. But now we're talking about faith as a gift of the Spirit. And so I'm going to try to expand this thought a little bit. Uh, this, this is a gift of power that operates through the Holy Spirit for the performance of supernatural exploits. In fact, kind of the rest of what I'm going to talk about this morning kind of flows out of this one. You've got to have this kind of faith. Now, let me contrast. Faith as a fruit of the Spirit grows as we abide in Christ and his word abides in us. That's the fruit of the Spirit, faithfulness. But the gift of faith is given without merit, uh, without, it, you don't have to grow necessarily. God can just, boom, give you this kind of faith, supernatural faith. Okay? It's God's reserve of faith when basic faith might fail. It's the supernatural endowment of faith and. It's generally given in times of danger, distress, or dire need. Okay, let, let me further contrast. I, I found this illustration. I think it's excellent. Saving faith is like a bucket of water. It can quench your thirst and clean you up. Fruitful faith or faithfulness is like indoor plumbing. It supplies what you need for daily living. But then there's the gift of faith, and that's like a fire hydrant because it provides an abundant supply as needed. And so we kind of get a little contrast, though they're all faith, there's a little subtle differences between each one. And we need each one. We need the bucket of faith to, to clean us up and satisfy our thirst. We need the indoor plumbing of faith to be faithful in our daily living. And boy, sometimes we need the fire hydrant of faith because we're in an impossible situation and we just need God to carry us through. We need all of it. Now, uh, I believe the gift of faith is faith that can command with confidence. Uh, Jesus put it this way in Mark eleven twenty three: If anyone says to this mountain, Go, throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes what he says will happen. It will be done for him. And so there can be a, such a stirring of the Holy Spirit in a person that you can just speak a word, and it's going to happen. Now, that's, I'm not just saying kind of wishful thinking, but when the Holy Spirit is stirring something in your heart, that can happen. I also think that this faith is faith that sees with certainty and it can wait without wavering, this gift of faith. Examples, Abraham took Isaac up to the mountain with confidence that God would provide a sacrifice. If you recall the story, God actually instructed Abraham to take his son Isaac up to the mountain and offer Isaac as a sacrifice. That was the, what God commanded, but the scripture tells us there and then again in Hebrews that Abraham actually figured out that God must have some other plan in mind. I'll be obedient, but I know God has a different plan. So he could see with certainty something else was going to happen. And then Joshua and Caleb, uh, they were the two faithful ones uh, when the Israelites were on the border of the promised land. But because of the sin of the nation, they had to wait 40 more years to actually get into the promised land. And yet, their faith stayed strong, and they were still warriors when they entered the land. And so they waited without wavering. That's supernatural faith. Here's some other examples. In 1 Samuel 17, David spoke with absolute confidence to Goliath. 
you recall the story, uh, in a nutshell, he says, yeah, you're a big dude, but today you're going down. Okay, Pastor Phil's paraphrase. But he was absolutely positive that he was going to win. In Daniel 3.17, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego trusted God when they were thrown into the fiery furnace. They just had a, a strong faith that was unwavering. In Daniel chapter 6, Daniel trusted God in the lion's den. Yep. Daniel said, God can shut those lion's mouths. And he did. In uh, Matthew chapter 8, the centurion, who really wasn't even a believer, but he had faith that Jesus would heal his servant. And it happened. In Luke 17, the leper's faith enabled healing from Jesus. In Acts 4, uh, Acts 14, rather, Paul was able to see that the man who was crippled from birth had faith to be healed, and then he was healed. Supernatural faith. Supernaturally imparted by the Holy Spirit, it brings the limitless resources of heaven to meet the needs of man in times of stress or difficulty according to the occasion or need. It's a supernatural faith which provides confidence, protection, or provision. It's the power of God that comes on a person that just makes them unwavering. I just know that I know that I know because God said so. Supernatural faith. A real-life example I could think of was uh, one of my college professors. His name was Lowell Simmons. And he, he told about in his younger days he had a bout with cancer. And he tells that um, his friends and family were all just distraught and terribly discouraged because he had cancer. But he said, I never was. I, I knew God was going to heal me. He just was just certain. God had spoke it to his heart, and he trusted it, and guess what? God healed him. But he was unwavering. He could see it with certainty. It didn't shake his world up at all. He knew God was going to heal him. That's a gift of faith. Okay. Now, I think a lot of us have the kind of faith that says, well, I know God can heal me, and I hope he does. But in Lowell's case, there was an absolute certainty. God's going to heal me. He just knew. That's an example of of this kind of faith. Okay, then we talk, let's talk about gifts of healing. How many could use a healing? Okay. Gifts of healing are the supernatural abilities imparted by the Spirit to cure and restore the human body from sickness, disability, or evil spirits. Did you know that God is a healer? And he gives these gifts of healing from time to time as well. Now, it is interesting that it's gifts in the plural. Um, and here's just some thoughts on why that might be. You know, there, the variety of sicknesses that we might experience, or there's many. You know, some are um, just by heredity or genetics. Some can be from accidents. Some just because we don't take care of ourselves. <laughs> Other times... Um, might be something that we got into and didn't know about. And then even other times, there can be a spiritual dimension of like a demonic sort of thing that's making a person sick. And we actually see that Jesus distinguished between some of those things. There are times when it says he simply healed a person. Other times it says he cast out a demon to heal a person. And so maybe that's why there's gifts of healing. I'm not entirely sure. But let's be clear, this is not just everyday healing. Okay? God designed the human body so marvelously that it's designed to heal itself over time. Okay? That's the way God created us. Doctors, hospitals, and nurses, they help along the way, but that's not supernatural. Okay? Their services are as simply assisting the body's natural healing. Okay? And I'm glad that God made us that way because I've hurt myself plenty of times and I need my body to get better. <laughs> Some of you have had similar experiences. Now, this gift of healing provides a supernatural cure that cannot be reproduced by doctors. 
This is often displayed in what might be considered hopeless situations is when you see the gift of healing. But it can happen just in everyday sort of things as well. I've, you know, people have a cold or, or the flu, and God can heal that. Here's some biblical examples. In 2 Kings chapter 5, Naaman was healed of leprosy after being instructed to dip himself in the river, and he was healed. 2 Kings chapter 20, Hezekiah had a boil, and it was so bad that he was going to die, but he was healed. Uh, in Matthew chapter 4, it tells us that Jesus healed every disease and sickness of the people in the crowd. In Acts chapter 5, the apostles healed the sick and those tormented by evil spirits. In Acts chapter 8, it says that Philip cast out evil spirits and healed those who were paralyzed and crippled. And so we have biblical examples, and it's not just Jesus that is healing people. God is in the healing business, and he can use ordinary people like you and me to do it. Now, this often happens through the spoken word, um, just saying, you know, in Jesus' name, be healed. Uh, And we kind of see that in Matthew chapter 8 with the centurion and his servant. The centurion was asked Jesus to heal his servant, and Jesus didn't go to the servant, talk to the servant. He just said, okay, he'll be healed. And then they found out later that it was about that moment that he was healed. And so just by saying the word, he was healed. Other times, healing could come through the laying on of hands. Uh, We find this in Mark chapter 6. Jesus was in his hometown, and uh, the people there were having a little hard time believing in him because he's homeboy, you know. And it says that he didn't do a whole lot of miracles there, but he did heal some by the laying on of hands. And then it can also... Healing can happen through a lot of various forms of contact, and we see some kind of strange ones. Uh, In Acts chapter 5, just Peter's shadow, and people would be healed. If Peter walked by and his shadow touched them, they'd get healed. Um, In Acts chapter 19, Paul had a cloth that they anointed and prayed for, and then they would take that cloth, and they would touch it to somebody, and that person would get healed. Phenomenal stuff can happen. Healing. And if I open the floor to ask who has a testimony about healing, I, I know for sure we'd get a number of them. Can I just get an amen from those of you who could testify to that? Okay? So Pastor Phil isn't just making this stuff up. It's in the Bible, and we have some people right here that would tell you this is real stuff. Okay? Here's just a couple of examples, though. Uh, a couple of them are from Tijuana. Uh, David shared with me that there was a time when they were praying for a young man who had a big welt on his jowl. And even as they were praying, it physically began to shrink right there on the spot. Yeah. Dave says another time he was praying specifically with a woman who could not hear, and he began to whisper. And she said she could hear him perfectly. Some of you uh, might remember the time that uh, Hope Scott was here and she was having trouble with her shoulder and we had all been praying for her and one Sunday morning uh, she was up here praying and she thought somebody was standing behind her praying for her but when she turned around there was nobody there but her shoulder was working just fine gift of healing God is in the healing business and I want to say to you before we're done today if you would like to pray for healing we're going to pray for healing and let's just see what God might do You with me? Okay. Now, let's talk about miraculous powers. This is the working of miracles. It's a supernatural demonstration of God's power, and it actually affects the laws of nature, uh, where nature might be temporarily altered, suspended, or controlled for a specific purpose. This is the really wow moments. Okay? Okay. And let's just talk a little bit about the words, the working of miracles. If you go back to the Greek language, which the New Testament is written in, the words are energemata dunamea. Now, it's all Greek to me. But I can tell you what those words mean. 
The first one, we get our word energy from. The second word, we get our word dynamite from. So we could say this gift of miracles is the energy of dynamite or explosions of the Almighty. Okay? This gift is also at times called signs and wonders. Now a sign simply is proof of the genuine. Something phenomenal happens and you're like, okay, I guess this must be real. That's the idea of a sign. Uh, So miracles are performed as an evidence of God at work. And then a wonder is simply something extraordinary. It's out of the course of nature. It's a wonderful thing. It's kind of, it, it's the effect it has on people. When they see something this phenomenal, they're kind of in wonder and awe. And we see um, some of these in the scripture. In Matthew 14, Jesus fed the 5,000 with just a little bit of food. And so he provided for people in need. And that was a miraculous wonder. Okay? Uh, in Exodus 14, uh, we see it when God delivered his people uh, out of Egypt and they crossed the Red Sea. A miraculous wonder. A wall of water on both sides of them. And they walked through it. Then we see it in Acts chapter 14 when Paul and Barnabas are preaching and God confirms the word with a miracle. It's, so that case is a miraculous sign because he was kind of saying listen to what these guys are saying and then uh, in John 10 38 um, Jesus even instructed people if you don't believe everything I say then believe the miracles at least so he's saying this this is evidence of God at work when you see these things it's a sign here's some more examples Exodus chapter 3, Moses received his calling from God from a burning bush. The bush was burning, but it didn't burn up. And a voice was coming from the bush. That is not normal. It's a miracle. Okay? Exodus, all through Exodus, starting in chapter 7 and following Uh, Moses demonstrates God's power with his staff and variety of miraculous things he does. We've already talked about uh, the the Red Sea and walking through on dry ground. Uh, How about when uh, these millions of Israelites were out in the desert and God provided manna from heaven and then water from a rock? It's a miracle. That doesn't just happen. In Joshua, uh, several chapters in there, we see the people crossing over the Jordan River. Again, the water piles up a, a town away, and they walk through on dry ground. Okay? That doesn't happen. Uh, when, they, when they shouted and blew the trumpets, the walls of Jericho came falling down. Here's another one. The sun stood still in Joshua. It's a miracle. That's not normal. In Matthew chapter 8, Jesus simply calmed the storm. Peace be still. And the storm stopped. In John 14, I mentioned Jesus fed the 5,000, but in that same chapter, he also walked on water. I've seen Mythbusters try to uh, reproduce that. They can't do it. (laughs) You cannot walk on water. Unless it's frozen. But it wasn't frozen. Remember, there was waves. And Peter sank, but Jesus walked on the water. In Luke chapter 8, Jesus raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. In Acts chapter 9, uh, Saul was, had been blinded for a few days, but when, uh, when he was prayed for, his sight was restored. And then also in that same chapter, Tabitha was raised from the dead. Supernatural. In Acts chapter 20, Paul raised Eutychus from the dead after falling from a window. And it was a good thing he did because he fell out of the window because Paul was just droning on and on, talking too long. 
And the guy, the poor guy fell asleep, fell out the window. So Paul went down and raised him from the dead. I'm thinking, that's the bullet there. But it was supernatural power of God. In Acts 28, Paul was bitten by a poisonous snake, and yet he just shook it off and nothing happened. It's a miracle, the power of God. Now, miraculous powers, this gift can happen through simply speaking the words. Uh, Here's another example. Jesus simply spoke to that fig tree that was not producing any fruit, and it withered. All he had to do was say the words. It can also happen through prayer and through touch. Jesus prayed, and he broke the bread, and then he fed 5,000 people with it. And it can happen through objects. Um, Moses' staff. Why God chose to use the staff, I don't know. But he used it and did some phenomenal things with Moses' staff. This gift of miracles, I think, is kind of rare today. I have not ever seen anybody raised from the dead. I've heard some stories of some. Generally, somewhere else, not here. Um, And some of these other things, we just don't see these very often. And so I was struggling to think of a a real-life example of this. And the only one I can put my finger on that was really close to home is my story of stupidity. Now, some of you have been here a long time, and so you've heard me talk about this before, but I realized just this past week that there are some people here who have never heard my story of stupidity. But it demonstrates a miracle. Here's the story. David and I, see, it always starts with more than one person, Um, These railroad tracks that run through Boone, they also run across the Raccoon River, which is only about a quarter mile from where I grew up. And we used to climb around on the railroad tracks over the river. Okay, are you getting the idea of stupidity already? (laughs) Okay, you get it. Uh, If I elaborate all the details, you'll think, yeah, you guys were really dumb. Um, But we would, you know, there's these steel girders, and they go down to these big cement uh, bases that then go down into the river. Okay, we would climb down to those big cement bases. Climb all around them. And yes, trains were going over all. Yeah, we were dumb. There was also power lines that went right through that area next to when you stood on the cement, the power lines were like right here. Now, this was in the days when Star Wars was a new thing and a big deal. And we had heard that the way they made the laser sounds out of the laser cannons was by hitting wires. You can see where we're going, Uh but don't get ahead of me. And so there happened to be a stick there, and I think we were just hitting it with a stick, and it was kind of making the sound, but... You know, I don't know if you know me or not. I'm a, I can be a bit of, per, of a perfectionist. And I could hear this little knocking sound in there, too. And I'm thinking, that's not right. Let me try to stop that. And I grabbed the wire. I screamed right out loud. Dave says he felt the shock, even though we were not touching. But I was able to let go with no burn. No, nothing. Now, my joints ached for a couple of days. I should have been dead. I really should have been dead. Now, what makes that more than just a stupid story? Here's here's what we found out. A couple days later, we were talking with family about this incident. And we were able to put together that my grandma had just an urge to Pray for me, and it happened to be right about that time. You see, it was a miracle. I should have been dead. But my grandma was moved by the Spirit to pray for me, and it spared my life. (laughs) 
and it makes for a great story too, right? (laughs) Gifts of capability, gifts of power, faith, healing, miraculous powers, these are all from the Holy Spirit, and he gives them to each one just as he determines, and he's still in this business today. These reveal the working of the Holy Spirit. They go beyond insight and speaking to give a demonstration of power. It reminds me of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, where Paul says, My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. And I've been praying for that this year, that we would see demonstrations of power in 2019. And I believe God is faithful. He's going to answer that prayer. And we're going to see some cool stuff. And then I want to just remind you one more time, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 1, simply says, eagerly desire spiritual gifts. I know some of these things sound kind of out there if you're not familiar with them. But the Bible says, eagerly desire these things. That's where I'm at. If God can do healing and miracles and this kind of faith, then count me in. I want in on that. How about you? Yes, amen. Lead us in that song again. And if you want prayer for healing, come stand here in the front. We'll pray with you. Some other people... Perhaps we'll come help me and pray, but let's sing first.